My name is Jennifer Gray Thompson, and I am the CEO of After the Fire. Welcome to the podcast, How to Disaster, Recover, Rebuild, and Reimagine. In this podcast, we bring you the very best practices, best hearts, and great ideas from other disaster-affected communities. Thank you for joining us. Welcome once again to the How to Disaster podcast, where we help you recover, rebuild, and reimagine. My name is Jennifer Gray Thompson, and I am the CEO of After the Fire USA, a nonprofit that helps communities navigate megafires. Today's guests, yes, that's right, two guests are coming on. Today's guests um, are here to talk about how to do equity in emergency management. You know, equity, sustainability, these are all things and terms that are sort of, you know, tossed around in every industry. But I always like to talk about, like, how do we actually do it? What does it look like? And how does it change according to the community that you're serving? One of the things that's exciting about having Alicia Johnson and Dave Reed on is that they're here to talk about their experiences in Santa Cruz in particular. So Dave Reed is the director of the Office of Recovery and Resiliency for the County of Santa Cruz. And Alicia Johnson is a private contractor with Two Lynchpin Road. Um, she works closely with Dave on um, I, you know, things that are going on in Santa Cruz, particularly related to the floods of the last year. Last year, Santa Cruz had massive, unprecedented flooding, and this is a county that's actually experienced a lot of different disasters. They're incredibly resilient, but it's interesting to see how they're at the intersection of, you know, really having a lot of um, extra challenges around disaster. It's one of the most seismically fragile, in many ways, places in the state of California. And the other thing is, is that it has the steepest mountains in the state as well. They had a major mega fire in uh, 2020, and that's how I came to meet Dave, is that anytime there's a mega fire, that's where we go. And in um, 2020, in the summer, they had a lightning complex fire. A complex fire means that they had many fires that then came together to form one very large fire incident. Um, in the case of Santa Cruz, they were particularly vulnerable because fire really loves an uphill climb. So, you know, Dave has been on the ground dealing with that, dealing with the recovery and the rebuild. The other thing about Santa Cruz is that they have everything from very, um, you know, high end um, wealthy homes, you know, but they also, it goes all the way to off grit, like up at last chance. And so the challenges are very, they're very, um, uh, they take a lot of talent to actually do. And what Santa Cruz looks like, um, it, you know, what equity looks like in Santa Cruz is not the same as every place else. So I really wanted them to come on and to talk to you about some of those challenges, some of the stages of recovery. And one of the things that we're going to do is we're also going to talk about Maui as we're doing this and to talk about like, are there lessons learned in Santa Cruz that we can actually apply to Maui or that the people of Maui could listen to this podcast and they might be able to, you know, take some of the lessons learned. I know we're going out there soon and I'm sure by the time that this airs we will already have been there or we will currently be there. So thank you once again for spending this time with us on the How to Disaster podcast. Uh, I really love hosting this with you or for you and um, teaching how to recover, rebuild, and reimagine. So welcome and let's begin. Welcome once again to the How to Disaster podcast. I'd like to start today by um, having both uh, Dave and Alicia introduce themselves. Alicia, let's start with you. Sure. My name is Alicia Johnson. I'm the CEO of Two Lynchpin Road. I have more than 20 years of on-scene emergency management disaster experience throughout the Western United States. Uh, wildfire is definitely my favorite hazard to respond to. Um, and I've worked with Dave on and off on various projects related to wildfire planning and um, community organizations. Great. Thank you. And then Dave, do you mind introducing yourself? Sure. Um, my name is Dave Reed. I'm the director of the Office of Response, Recovery, and Resilience at the County of Santa Cruz. Our office was created just after our 2020, 2020 CZU fire um, to support community in all aspects of disaster response, preparedness, resilience. So the CZU Lightning Complex fire in 2020 was part of the worst wildfire season on record for the state of California, the state of Oregon, and I believe even the state of Washington. Um, you know, why do you think that you were chosen for this really challenging role? Because in Santa Cruz, this was a very complex doesn't mean difficult. It means that it was many fires that merged into one fire, in this case, lightning, not utility cause. So talk to us about how you came to be in this position. 
Sure. I, I, I spent the last eight years working in an elected official's office on kind of land use and environmental policy. And I have a background in climate change related issues and science. Um, and I think one of the things that was clear is that recovery is complex, has lots of layers to it, and it can be very political. And you have to be comfortable communicating with the public. You have to be willing to sit and talk through tough things with the community. And when you're working in an elected official's office, that's a lot of what you do is engage with the public and community about what is frustrating them or what is uh, of issue. So I came with that lens of really being community and constituent focused. And I think government is best when we are acting in the best interest of community and talking directly to community. Abs, I totally agree. And you know, it's it, government is an art. Most people don't understand what an art form it is because um, every time you operate inside of government, you have to know that every single thing that you write down is subject to PRA requests. Um, every person that you talk to, that they you are carrying the full weight of the government behind you. So they're not just thinking, oh, I'm talking to Dave, read that cool guy at the county. You know, I'm like, I'm talking to the county of Santa Cruz. And so it, it is an, it, it's an art form. It's challenging. Um, and so, Alicia, what brought you into the space of disaster? Yeah, I started in emergency management in 2004, right out of college, and I got involved quite by accident. Um, there was an ad in the newspaper, which tells you how long ago this was, and filled out an application to become a public information officer. Um, I spent a number of years working with the Chemical Stockpile Emergency Preparedness Program, um, and all throughout the United States and various sites, seven sites across the U.S., um, and really started to delve into what it looked like to help prepare community for what could be something very hazardous, and then delve into the all hazards component of that and using the techniques and tools that we developed across this nationwide program to build out all hazards preparedness in different communities across the U.S., and then eventually I made myself made my way farther west from Colorado to Utah and then on to California um, and spent a number of years working with the city of San Francisco on resilience and building community resilience in the neighborhoods. Um, and then moved up to Sonoma um, and was here in 2017 during the Sonoma County fires and got a chance to work with uh, the city of Santa Rosa and really helped build their recovery capacity as they started to delve into that long tail of what wildfire recovery looks like. So it's been, it's been definitely um, quite a ride. And what a great team in Santa Rosa too. I just have to say like, um, for most people, you like, I have no idea who those people are, but I would just like to say like, uh, David Gouin, um, he's now the city manager of Sonoma. I'm a Sonoma County person too. Um, they had, um, you know, uh, they're gay. They just had so many awesome people that um, I really draw upon them to this day to like figure out, you know, lessons for the for the future. So I love that you were part of that um, effort because there's so many. Um, Sean McGlynn, there's just so many people like when I was starting to help in paradise that I would actually draw from people in the city of Santa Rosa in particular um, from their disaster response. And so that's great experience. So today we're really here and um, we're going to talk about a lot of things, but we're really going to focus on what does equity look like in disaster management. And one of the things that I'm very passionate about is um, how to, is, is showing people how to actually do equity or what does that mean? instead of turning it into like a blanket term that can mean many, many things or that is somehow politicized, uh, one of the most important things you can do in disaster is figure out how to give everybody an equitable chance to actually recover and rebuild. Um, let's talk about uh, what that has meant um, in like in 2020. Um, Dave, I'm going to start with you because if you could explain for the audience the sort of I want to, you know, diversity and equity. I don't mean it like that. I mean, but the diversity of actual communities that you needed to serve and to make sure that they could recover. Like it was, it was a, your, the 2020 CZU lightning complex fire was a puzzle. Yeah. I mean, our, our fire burned a little over 80,000 acres in our County in our neighboring County, San Mateo County. And it burned through a number of rural communities, really small little rural neighborhoods that had very different um, histories to their development pattern, um, resources available to them. So there were some very affluent um, landowners that have big parcels, big properties, big homes. And then there were folks that aged in place from the 70s. They moved up there in the 70s and they lived in a small mountain cabin um, that they had amended, adjusted, adapted over time. Um, 
And all of those folks had different financial situations, right? Some of them, some of them, again, had been there for decades. They were maybe land rich, but resource poor in terms of their, their cash flow and ability. They were likely underinsured. And then we had lots of folks that were kind of unseen in the rental market, right? There are people who own five acres and they let somebody pull a trailer up to the corner of the property and, and live kind of on the land in a low footprint environment, but they're off the radar, right? They're, they've got a PO box. They're not seen known to the County. And that was a, both a rental income for those property owners, maybe, but a place that the, that those residents could live cheaply in a very uh, expensive environment. So just all through the spectrum of, of community members in terms of their income status, their home ownership versus renter status. Well, in addition to that, you also had an off-grid community, a community that had been sort of at odds with the county for decades um, and at that last chance. And um, they were very self-reliant. Um, and this sort of it didn't make them any less self-reliant in their rebuilding, but really in the effort to sort of bring them back into compliance or that there, there, there were, there are significant challenges that I imagine are ongoing. Um, Last Chance is actually located at the top of um, a mountain next to Bonnie Dune. I don't know what, I don't know what the proper term, what, what would the proper term for that be where they're located? Yeah. I mean, they're, they're in our kind of coastal zone. They're on a ridge line adjacent to a very affluent community called Bonnie Dune. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's very beautiful up there, but it takes about an hour and a half to go up a road that's not really a road. Um, and that my workers comp like halfway up, I'm like, this is just, this is just wrong. Um, but it was stunning. But it's definitely one of those places where they, but it's by intention that it's not easy to get to. And so, and then the challenge becomes how do you actually serve everyone from you know last chance to Bonnie Dune, which is much wealthier. Um, Alicia, when you came into the work, um, did you, on the 2020 fires, um, did you work on any of these issues with equity with Dave or what is your take on that? Yeah. You know, one of the most, um, memorable moments for me in terms of equity in Sonoma in the 2020 fires was setting up the long-term recovery center. And, uh, in Sonoma, that particular fire hit again, the same type of equity, um, concerns that presented in Santa Cruz also presented in 2017 in Sonoma. And when we were there and set up the long-term recovery center, the the one thing that really shocked me was I walked in one morning, the very first morning was set up. I walked in, there was a uniformed highway patrol at the door and I'm, you know, a white female walking in. I was like, this is a little strange, but you know, and I, turned to look to the street and saw um, what was very clearly a migrant workers vehicle parked across the street with individuals who were talking, you know, hard to tell if they were going to get out of their vehicle or not. And I realized it kind of hit me like a load of bricks, like, oh, they're not coming in because there's a uniformed individual here that they will not cross. They, They, even if they have a green card, they're not going to cross because they're too concerned about their status. And by the time I had spoken to the person who was running the long-term recovery center to remove that security guard, put them in plain clothes, you know, do something else other than what was actually happening, those individuals had had left. And we ended up having to figure out another way to reach that community. And it's the same, the same thing that's happening in Last Chance versus Bonnie Dune or between Last Chance and, and Bonnie Dune, right? Not they're not competing against each other, but how do we reach all of those individuals given where they are in the community? Um, and that's dependent on the community that you're serving. It's what's right in front of you and trying to develop the most equitable approach. Those approaches are very very different depending on where you live and what has happened to that community at that time. I think that that's one of the most important lessons about disaster generally is that, you know, we can take all of our skills, we can walk into a community, but if we don't listen and if we don't figure out, you know, what it is that they need, then we're not going to, we're not going to be as much um, help as we would like to be. You know, one of the, I'm also a Sonoma person. And one of the things that, um, and I worked for an elected official and we had our fires. So that was, um, 
it gave me a lot of access that I would have never had. And I learned a lot of lessons that I would have never learned uh, otherwise. Um, and I'm grateful for that because I, I feel like all of those lessons are what I take into my work ever since then. But, you know, we also made mistakes here and some of them are for sure, like having a, a uniformed person um, at the opening of not just the assistance centers, but also at the shelters. And so it really, and, and we did not have anything in place to do any kind of um, translation. So the, so the county actually had to pull from people who happened to be Spanish speakers and writers at the county um, in order to really push stuff out in Spanish. And it tended to lag. Like I had to go and find a translator to actually do the Cal, um, Cal Fire daily briefing alongside, but I was like, how is this, this ad hoc? Like, why would this, we have 27% uh, Latinx population here. And so how are we doing, you know, how did that happen? And it really wasn't, even though we went through three more mega fires, it really wasn't until we were partway through COVID um, that the county really figured out how to, which we also had the glass fire during COVID, that um, that they had to do it differently. And we actually had asked the community specifically, like, okay, well, how do we reach um, people in a way that has trust? Because it's not enough at the outside of the shelter to put a sign saying ICE won't be here. You actually have to say it on the radio because otherwise, because people have to make the decision to get all the way to the shelter in order to, to order to hear that they will not be deported for that. And that we're like, that's, you're missing a, you're missing a stage here and how can we do it in a way that um, maybe you don't listen to the radio in Sonoma County, but they do. And then we had people who also didn't speak Spanish, but spoke indigenous languages mm -hmm. of um, uh, Mexico and Latin, you know, Latin America in general. So then how did we get, you know, luckily we have a radio station here called KBBF and they were very good at that. We gave them a lot of grants, but it was um, often frustrating. And even a county who's been through it a lot and has done a lot of work, we still got a lot of stuff wrong, but I, I feel very confident now that it's much, much better. But that the CHP is a perfect example of they just won't, they won't go in and also UndocuFund um, had to be, we had to form a fund in order to replace wages for people who would never be eligible for any kind of FEMA. So let's go ahead and dive into FEMA. Dave, in your experience, you know, when you're looking at the issue of, of, of equity and then your lived experience, how do you match that with FEMA or what challenges did you see, um, during, especially in that first year, that span between the setup, the LTRG tends to take a minute, the disaster case management takes a minute. What did you see? Yeah, I mean, I think it's there's a two tiered piece to it, right? FEMA individual assistance and the SBA loan program are critical kind of first step resources for community. Um, and your, you know, FEMA comes in right off the bat and gets people to sign up. Um, one of the challenges, however, is that fire recovery takes a while to get started, right? You've got a debris removal process that may take you know, six, nine, 12 months. For us, it was close to 12 months before all the debris between phase one removal and phase two removal was done. And then when you have a disaster like we did in our rural community, rebuilding is complex and and, and expensive. And so for some folks, um, it's hard to know what you need in those first weeks and months, you know, when you're talking with FEMA or SBA, um, and it may take years, literally, until you're like, oh, gosh, my insurance gap between what I have and what I need is $250,000 um, or it's $200,000. And, and I only asked for a certain amount from SBA. And then you have to go through this process. So I think it's really um, it's educating people post fire around that long arc, as Alicia said, the long the long tail of recovery. But then also in a flooding disaster, it's different, right? It's much faster. You need resources quickly. And FEMA, um, depending on your language of, of preference, whether you have a documented child and you're undocumented, you're still eligible, but it's a hard navigation road to navigate. And it takes time and denials. And that, that denial in a flooding event is even more acute and important. Um, you, you know, you don't have the luxury of time when you want to get all of the wet stuff out of a home and not have it become a biohazard. You know, that's such can an important I, point. Can I add something really I'm going to actually punt this right to you. So okay. just give me one oh, second. Like, I'm, gonna go right, I'm queuing you up and then you can, you can be like, nah, I want to queue up in a different way. 
Um, except now I lost my train of thought. Go ahead, Alicia. Okay. <laughs> well, Probably I was going to say the same thing as my guest. So it's okay. okay. I was going to say this ties back exactly to what we were saying before, right? There's um, a really good concept called speed of trust. And the idea that you build according, you know, your that's it's one thing that you use in facilitation, but it's really related to how we use it in terms of community preparedness and public information. And Jennifer, what we were talking about before with Sonoma County and long-term recovery centers and how important it is to get initial resources to you as quickly as possible. And then Dave, that whole idea that, and we spend the rest of our, long tail, five years, 10 years, 25 years, um, cycling through that speed of trust, right? We, we created trust and then we broke trust and then we created it again. And then we broke it because that's how the cycle with FEMA works. It's so slow. And it's also, you know, it never is well-timed enough. It's it always feels like there's a certain level of friction. None of it is good between what's happening in the local community and what needs to happen with people who are over underinsured or have a gap in where they want to rebuild in their timing and the actual capacity to bring those dollars into community, not just for individual assistance, but also at the infrastructure level too, right? We have to make sure that communities are strong enough and more, more resilient enough to keep people in the community itself. If they can't keep you there and they have, you know, brain drain essentially, um, we're, you lose all that traction that you initially built. And it that takes even longer to regain the capacity and the trust. It, it was interesting. I'm sure Jennifer, you noticed this in 2017 when you were here, my family stayed here. We were, we lived in, um, in Sonoma proper. And so our house was not damaged, but you saw a huge exodus of people who either didn't want to rebuild, the memory was too raw, couldn't afford to rebuild, all those elements. And now you're starting to see people come back in. Um, maybe they're building something new on that property or um, they've bought a new home or something like that. And, and we're, emergency management is having now to rebuild that connection with the community about how important preparedness is and what preparedness looks like. So I think there's this, this kind of the cycle of it is really interesting and it fits in so well with what we're talking about in terms of delaying that capacity and rebuilding it and then kind of bouncing back and forth between I trust you and I know you're doing the right thing and I don't trust you at all. And I'm scared for what's going to happen next. Uh, well, there's a lot. Okay, there's a lot. So much to unpack there. I think that this actually, what you just, what, what you were just talking about, is a is a perfect sort of segue into just talking about the the process of denials, mm. because denials are a huge point of equity. And if somebody has institutional knowledge and institutional trust and believes that it's there for them, then they are much more likely to navigate it, to appeal, to go back, to make sure that they get what it is that they need. But even people who have really high institutional knowledge become intensely frustrated by the process. People with low institutional knowledge, low interaction, um, if some fear and distrust, especially if they're un, you know, undocumented, whatever it is, because if you have one person that's documented in the house, you are eligible for some kind of federal relief, but not everybody does. Um, you know, if you could each of you somehow address your experience with that denial process, and, and I'm going to give everyone a, a highlight here, is that in Sonoma County, we're about 97%, 95% rebuilt um, in five years. We just hit our six-year mark, so even more so. Um, but in places like Paradise, where there's really low institutional knowledge, low government trust, which we see a lot in mega fires in particular, they happen in a lot of places um, where people go like Eastern California to specifically not have big government. And then they interact with big government and then they are denied. And then they walk away because they're like, of course, the government's not going to give me what I want. They don't understand at all that the that's just part of the process. So talk about each of your experiences there. I'll start with Dave and then go to Alicia. Sure. Thanks. Um, I think for me, what what I've learned um, through both the CZU fire in 2020 and then our dual disasters in 2023 is the first step. Obviously, we've talked a lot about communication and, and communicating with the public. We need to be transparent. First, they need to sign up for FEMA individual assistance, right? Like a lot of people are like, well, why do I need to do that? Or what should I do? And, and if you don't sign up and you miss the deadline, you're out. 
So the first thing is to get them to sign up. Then it's to be super transparent that it is a complex process and you will get two, three, four denials and to expect that. Um, so for me, the first step was really making sure FEMA stayed as long as I could possibly keep them here. And I requested in our 2023 disasters that they keep their disaster resource recovery center open um, well after the disaster, all the way till um, almost July um, for a March disaster. And the reason being is that it's always easier to navigate a denial or the confusion of the process in person. Um, and so we had bilingual folks at those disaster recovery centers that FEMA was running. And that's the first line, right, is is getting getting you to be able to talk to a real person rather than be on a phone or be um, on the Internet, both of which may be challenging to, to access, right? Not everybody has access to the Internet. Not everybody has access to sit on hold um, for an indefinite period of time. But if you can go on a Saturday or in the evening after work, and visit somebody and talk to them in person. That was that was critically important. The next step for me is really the long-term recovery group. And Alicia talked a little bit about that in Sonoma County. And that's building a relationship with a trusted voice, hopefully, and a case manager, a disaster case manager that can can be tracking the denial, tracking the challenge, and helping remove the barriers, demystify the process, right? Because as we have talked about, Denial in FEMA land is really a synonym for request for more information. And if you got an email from the government that said, request for more information, you'd be like, oh, okay, I'll give you more information. I must not have checked the right box. When you get an email from the government that says denial, especially when you don't speak English as your first and native tongue, you're like, okay, I'm done, I'm out. Like I've just been denied. And so we have to demystify the language um, easier to do that in person, and then also e better to do that if you have somebody who's an advocate for you. And we have to build those structures as community. So for folk communities that are going through it for the first time, it's a both and, right? You need to move forward with the DRCs, getting people into those locations, but then you also have to think about that long tail, especially in wildfire, and get that disaster case management system, that long-term recovery group system that advocacy system in place to help folks who are struggling through the process. Alicia, what do you want to add to that? I mean, uh, amen <laughs> to everything that was just said. I completely If you want agree. to dive more into LTRGs, I would love for you to do that or disaster yeah. managers, because those are two things that are a total mystery until it happens to a community. Yeah. I think that you, you can't overstate it enough that the long-term recovery group Group, the LTRG is critical. It doesn't even matter the hazard, right? Like Santa Cruz County was hit with a wildfire and also a flood. Long-term recovery is part of both of those things, right? So it can be after the fire. It could be after any other hazard. The idea that you have created, again, that group of trusted agents, if you will, in the community who will help facilitate that process through the whole way, right? They're, they're not one-offs. They're not going to be there um, just temporarily to sort of, you know, make sure you get your first application in. And then when you get the denial, say, oh yeah, you're supposed to do another one and then leave, right? We want somebody to help facilitate that process the entire way and guide you through. Most individuals who are applying for individual, individual assistance, they've not applied for it before. Exactly. Right. So they don't know how the process works. They're not comfortable or familiar with that. They don't speak the language. Um, even if they're well educated and have an assumption that the government is going to help them, they're still going to be, as Jennifer, as you said, they're still going to be frustrated with the process. Couple that with the inequities that already exist in our communities across the board. And you've got huge problems when you don't include those types of advocates really building that process forward. Where do those advocates come from? I think that's a really interesting question that's probably unique to every community. They can be through various services and other ways, but you know, it's it plays plays around with what that looks like. But I think it's really key that you have to have them set up. I think it's a huge um it's a huge vulnerability is the DCMs um, in the entire system because I will say without mentioning the name of the company that. You know, in, in our case, um, starting in 2020, not before, and I'm not talking about the disaster case managers before, but there was one company 
um, that was offered a contract that applied for essentially like they had been doing some COVID stuff for DCMs. And so they were like, we'll apply for wildfire. We'll just do it. And um, they they received it because they had a special category. And then um, they and I had their DCM starting to contact me and they were like, like panic eyes, like trauma eyes, like I don't know how to do this or I don't even speak Spanish or I, what do I do? And, and then because they were getting the full weight of the emotional and, you know, and I mean, it's such a hard thing to do navigation and, and then, which is different in for fire than it is for housing. Like you could, there's nothing left to muck. There's no blue root. You can't blue tarp anything. And so where do you put people? And I had fully panicked, fully traumatized DCMs contacting me. So I contacted the organization i was like you're you are you not only are you dealing with a traumatized community but you have not trained your people to do what they're supposed to do and then the state of california gave them 16 more counties in response and i was just like you know what i've said my bit here i don't know what to say but i cannot overemphasize enough that when you do look for a dcm contract as a lead as a county leader as the state you've got to find people who actually match the community in front of you that you want them to serve otherwise you're you're not serving them um, you're doing it for this for speed or efficiency, but the the damage that's done to the person trying to provide the service and who they're providing it to. I had this guy who's like, I am a yoga teacher, but he was trying to find tiny homes for people that he was, and he was fully like um, flipped out. And I and I just cannot overemphasize enough that as a point of equity, you know, anytime you can, if there is a if there is a um, you know, break it up if you have to. If there's a, a community, you know, resource center like La Luz, give them a see if they can do DCM work for two years or something like that because they already know and they already have the trust. Like you so well pointed out, Alicia, that's so important in the community. The trust factor in equity just cannot be um, overstated. So um, now, Alicia, I'm going to go back to you and then back up to Dave. Um, you know, LTRGs look different in different places. Like the Campfire Collaborative goes on to this day. Um, they they helped mentor the Dixie Fire Collaborative, how they were going to do it and how LTRGs play out is different. Um, in Sonoma County, it wasn't, I mean, I knew a lot of the people on the LTRG, but it felt like they were sort of trading um, uh, um, case stories and then were figuring out like who was going to take what. It wasn't as visible as it is as it was for the campfire, the Dixie fire. And then um, Dave, you, um, you, you contracted that out to one of my favorite people, Valerie Brown. Um, I like her so much, but um, can we talk about... I, I can actually start with either of you who wants to go first. Um, what's how how are LTRGs in your experience? Oh, that's long term recovery group. We always have to be careful over and over again with um, with acronyms because not everybody has has them. Like we have a DAC, a LAC, and a DRC. They're all <laughs> the same thing. You know, it's lo local assistance center, disaster assistance center, disaster resource. Anyway, on. So let's talk about LTRGs and equity. Um. Okay, so Sure. Um, so I think one of the things that's important um, relationally is that your long-term recovery group structure, the disaster case management folks, have a good, strong fiscal agent associated with them. And that may not be the same organization, right? And so that the, the reason behind that is you may get uh, philanthropic donation support dollars coming into your community. And you want those to go to a trusted source, somebody that's been in the community for a long time. For us, it's the Santa Cruz County Community Foundation. Um, an amazing woman, Susan True, is their executive director. They collected and held the money, right? And then there's a relationship between the long-term recovery group, disaster case managers, and unmet needs, Right. So as we as we recognize that the federal government, the SBA, all those resources are not enough or not timely or not uh, adaptable, that disaster case management structure, that long term recovery group structure and the unmet needs committee of that can help get some of those dollars out in the immediate aftermath, gift cards, gas cards, clothing. But then as the long tail of recovery continues, they hold some of that money, ideally and can help people with water tanks, inspection requirements, technical studies that are required that are above and beyond what their recovery resources financially might be able to, to address. So there's a holistic relationship that you wanna have in your long-term recovery group with the financial side. 
And then I would also just say that for us in Santa Cruz County, I and, and OR3 have been in relationship with the long-term recovery group, right? Because there are times when those disaster case managers working with community members hit a wall with the process and they need the governmental structure because FEMA talks to the government more than they talk to the individual sometimes. Um, we need to remove those barriers, right? So as an example, in 2023, private road damage. FEMA individual assistance doesn't hasn't historically loved private road damage. We figure it out a way that each property owner along a, a private road could apply for a little bit of the cost to recover and rebuild that road damage. And FEMA worked through a process to be able to give each of those property owners a little bit of the money towards the total repair. That takes a relationship with county and FEMA and county and community. We have to be an intermediary and a liaison. So I think there's like those dual relationships that I just wanted to share with the community out here. By the way, you're the first emergency or, or recovery person that I've talked to who has sort of cracked that FEMA, you know, the road code for individual assistance. And I saw it um, at, uh, at at a property in Davenport when I was there to speak and they had built a little bridge. Anyway, we lost 70 private bridges in Sonoma County alone. So I just want to say good job. Good job. It's a huge deal. Go ahead, Alicia. I think the unique element of community to county, county to fed that that continuum has to it's critical to long-term recovery whether it's inside or outside the ltrg um is irrelevant but keeping that conversation going throughout the long tail is really important the one piece that i would add to what dave has already said is that anytime you're working with the ltrg i think those individuals need to be trained and have some mental stamina of what they're going to be hearing we talked about this at, after the fire conference. It's what the average is seven times you, as a survivor, you have to tell your story in order for it to start coming out of your, you know, coming back into your body and not necessarily having the trauma of survival. And those long-term recovery caseworkers are the people who are hearing that story over and over and over again from all of the individuals they're working with, because they're not just working with one at a time, they're working with many different individuals. And so they're hearing the same or similar story over and over and over throughout a day or throughout a week. And being able to help them metabolize that, I think is a really key part of keeping that long-term recovery group going over time, right? And not just having those individuals tap out and say, okay, I've done it for a month, I can't do it anymore that's a huge waste of capacity and training and opportunity and trust that is so integral to actually building that long-term capacity in the community. I love that you use the word metabolize. I'm totally going to steal that because I've, I've been thinking about this for, for years. Um, and, and Alicia, tell us like, because I mean, we all, I'm, I'm leading the witness, but what happens when they don't metabolize? It's not just that they won't be there for a month. Even people who stay in it for years, what happens to them? They burn out. And in the classic sense, right, they they do exactly what first responders do when they don't metabolize their own trauma, that it affects their community, it affects their families, it affects their job, the, the whole thing, right, the crash and burn. And you see that over and over and over through first response, through LTRG components. And in some ways, those long-term recovery uh, individuals who are, you know, case managers, they are first responders, right? Not necessarily to the incident, but they're first responders and realizing that. I think they're going to be first, second, and third responders. Like yes. I've been calling us a third responder since we were formed 11, uh, six years ago yesterday. I'm like, that's because I, you know, you do need those multiple levels yep. of responders. And it, and, and, and it's so important that you actually help, um, you know, the trauma factor until you've undergone it, and even after you've undergone it, people are like, oh, yeah, that was six weeks ago that happened. I should be fine today. And then six months later, you're like, well, I got through the first six months. I'm totally fine. And then a year later, you're like, I was not fine. And then two years later, you're like, boy, I really wasn't fine for the first two years. You know, I wasn't anyway. And I know a lot of people like that, like the helper piece of it. Um, it, it, you know, it, it, in order to maintain all of the trust too, like we just absorb so much trauma, but to be yeah. like, um, culture, bicultural and bilingual means you're going to, so you're going to, you're just going to understand it so much better, which really brings us to one of the things that we wanted to talk about today, 
um, which is, you know, some of the lessons that you see from Maui when we're watching that, you know, we're, we're all watching that. We, you know, I, my phone absolutely blew up from people who were like, I want to go, I want to help. You know, we all fire survivors and all leaders in this space start hyperventilating um, with the desire to assist. And so um, Alicia, I'll start with you and then go to Dave. Um, what's um, what, what, you know, name like one of the things that you see, we can have a longer conversation that you see um, that is of great concern to you or, you know, making sure that they get to where they need to be in the, for the next stage of recovery. Yeah, I think one of the things that's really great concern for me is the inequity that that already existed in Lahaina and on Maui. The, you know, as a tourist, when you go to Hawaii, you're, you're there for a week or two weeks, you um, frequent the beaches, you go to the restaurants, you just enjoy paradise, right? When you live there, th there's it's a totally different situation. You have very, very wealthy people with a lot of property akin to Santa Cruz and very, very unwealthy people with small properties or maybe large properties that they inherited from somebody and um, are underinsured. Or not insured at all, and so there's a lot of of diversity in in the way that that manifests, and that also means that the way that LTRG and FEMA individual assistance and all the other apparatus that we have to work with um, to help communities recover has to be incredibly nuanced because the people that you're working with are all individuals. They have very individual stories. They have very individual needs. And to treat them as if they're, you know, Maui as a big group is, is I think, folly on, on everyone's part. And Dave, what are you seeing that's, that's your biggest concern? I think what's interesting and concerning for me when looking at it from, from my vantage point is recognizing that when you have a, a tourism-based economy, and you have a lot of service worker community members living in an impacted disaster impacted community those folks lost their home which there's a high likelihood that it was a rental for them that they probably didn't own it so so rent, we know from disaster that renters it's harder for renters to recover than homeowners they have generally less resources available to them um the other thing is they've lost their job their income stream and it may not be coming back for years, right? So, so I think for me that the lost voices are that service worker community. Where are they going to find sustaining income for the years that it's going to take to recover, right? All of the other service working community members on the island or the islands, as an example, right? That Those jobs are taken. There's not a dearth or surplus of extra service worker jobs that are available. So we as government and the state and federal government, right, there are resources for people for an acute period of time to help with lost wages. But fire takes so much longer that I worry not only about their rebuilding their home or a place for them to live, but also what is their income stream? And that's just like a double um, double impact that, that I hope um, there's, an, there's a path forward to support those community members with. And then there's this secondary impact, which we also saw here in a tourist-driven economy for Sonoma and Napa, where people who were not directly impacted by the disaster were secondarily impacted by the loss of tourism and the loss of hospitality jobs. And like the number, I mean, we had such a high percentage of our um, workforce was hospitality. And then the question, and we had such a low, like Maui, um, rental vacancy rate. So we had 1% when we had our fires. And so the big puzzle, like I, I can't, I can't even recall how many conversations that I sat in about um, what to do so that we didn't lose our workforce because we were going to come back. Um, but how do we retrain them too? Because where are they going to live um, and you want people to be able to stay home. Like most people can, can, they can, they can fathom or they can deal with losing their actual house, but it's the loss of their home and their community that um, is just gutting for them. And so, you know, I, I, I know that Sonoma County is sharing some of the same lessons around tourism, but one of the things we've been trying to push out a lot is 
there's an opportunity here to retrain hospitality workers to rebuild the community in which they will also live. Um, and Mendocino actually did a really good job of this. They actually they retrained a lot of uh, cannabis workers during you know post disaster for them, and um, they got a lot of grants to do that. They ran one through us for about two hundred and seventy five thousand dollars for. Um, this guy really john kennedy this uh this guy that used to be a supervisor doesn't matter but um he did a good job though and they could build three twos uh three bedroom two um, bath house for eighty thousand dollars using the sort of retraining um model so i'm hoping that they get some of those models i i i hold a lot of those exact same concerns that you all are talking about and it's interesting because in you know, in Maui is we've just never seen such high land values with such low incomes. And we don't yet know what the rate of uninsurance is. We we always know that underinsurance is going to be massive, but the uninsurance and so many because culturally, so many people, um, multi-generations would live in one house. And so they are navigating fairly well, the making sure that they get some individual assistance. And I feel like they're very that they are doing good things culturally. We meet with their um, with Representative Takuda, their Congresswoman, and then Senator Hirono, their Senator. They are really pushing for. They got cultural monitors for the EPA process. They're going to get them for debris removal. Culturally, I'm very optimistic for them because they are so cohesive um, and protective as as a group. General, I'm generalizing now after after we just said that we shouldn't, but you know, I I am a little more optimistic for them than I would be in another community, but how that will be deployed and how they are going to um process through their trauma because the thing that I was super cranky for the month after it happened in particular because I couldn't stop thinking about the story of the little boy who was found like hugging his dog. Do you know, I was like I just I just couldn't get over that, but it was um that they lost so many people and their town and that there are people, there are a lot of people who lost a family member and or a friend who lost their home, who lost their job, who lost their town, who lost their business, like all, all in one person. Do you know, can you, and then that is really um, hard for, that's hard to fathom. We've seen other towns like Paradise be leveled, Greenville be leveled. But it was, and and there was a lot of um, loss of life in the campfire too. But it's sort of mind-boggling, though, to think about the puzzle of of Maui and um, and I anyway. So it's just one of those things that, and also their trauma, their level of trauma. And we are all, we've all seen a lot of trauma. I just feel like it's something a little bit more. And I'm I'm wondering how they're going. I'm watching to see how they go through that and how we can be of service. But you know, if you had like one piece of um and one one piece of advice you'd love to see for them, Alicia, what would that be? You know, in their navigation of the next six yeah. months. Just six I, months. I mean, six months you're barely waking up from yeah. from this, right? And as you pointed out, multiple traumas over and over. So like when you look at the stress scale and they they say, oh, you experienced the death of a loved one. That's, you know, the highest trauma you can have. Well, now times that by five, because you've experienced all these other things that are equally high that fall into that, that bracket. Um, I think in six months, you know, it's, it's respecting that the process of healing is just beginning, right? We talked about like six months from now, oh, I feel great you know, versus two years where like, oof, well, I was barely hanging on by my fingertips during those first six months. So just respecting the process. Um, and I think, you know, let's tap into what we said before. Denial does not mean the process is over. You just have to keep at it. And I think there's some, some stick to that's required within that first six months. And then also some ability to pause and rest and just appreciate that, that you are continuing to put one foot in front of the other every day. Uh, Dave, what could the government do in the first six months? Like when you look over there and you're looking at there, because the county of Maui has a mayor, which is interesting, but like, what do you think of from a government standpoint? Um, I think the thing that I've been really interested in trying to figure out and haven't done it well yet. So I would love to see um, if Maui and, and the state of Hawaii can figure this out is to lean into the recovery workforce development concept. I know that for Santa Cruz County, we are trades deficient, right? So we don't have enough folks that can rebuild our homes. That just only increases the cost of construction. Um, and, you know, for me, 
I have a, a huge farm worker community that makes ten, twelve dollars an hour at best. And I kept thinking, and I still want to find a way to build, bring them into the trades, give them a multi generational opportunity to have a uh, an income stream that is at a different order of magnitude. And so, knowing that the resources to rebuild in Maui will be constrained there may be an opportunity to really build that trade network through the community that's been impacted and what more powerful way to rebuild your community than to literally learn how to rebuild your community. And then you have that skill set that hopefully pays you more than that service worker um, salary may have paid you. And it could be transformative to your family moving forward for generations to come. So I think exploring that, knowing how resource independent uh, constrained they are, um, and we are as well is an interesting place for public and private sector to work together to build that workforce. Um, really quickly, I'm going to start with Dave and then go to Alicia. Um, uh, Post-disaster uh, housing, it's weird. It's not the same in Omega Fire. Um, in our case in Sonoma County, only about 168 people chose the FEMA temporary housing for the next 12 to 18 months um, in, in the trailers. But um what I mean, what do you have any ideas, Dave, for what they should be? I mean, I'm I'm watching. I watch all their social media, so I'm watching what they're doing. But I think we're also the more fires we have in the different places, we're going to have to think differently. So, yeah, I mean, it's a challenge, right? Because right now they're taking up their income stream, their tourism-based income stream, hotel rooms throughout the islands um, to house those residents. Um, because they're in a tropical environment, maybe there's an interim easier thing that can exist but well, the they hard... have a city that went in but no children can be there and so and then you can't cook in the hotel rooms so one of my favorite things to do is watch the local news in hawaii now that's what i i always do that for any fire we do i watch their social media and local news but um you know but what about is there an innovation in housing that you've seen that you know because i know that i know that you live in innovative housing so i am tapping into my special dave knowledge yeah, I mean, I think prefabricated material, you know, construction systems that can be tr shipped over nearly fully built and dropped on a flat pad is probably going to be, you know, a tool. And there's a lot of those, right? My home is partially SIPs panel construction, partial straw bale construction. I mean, those are green building techniques that have been around for centuries and decades, but prefabricated construction techniques that can be shipped over and stood up quickly is probably going to be the most effective way to get people into more stable housing than tents. Yeah. What do you think, Alicia? Any, any new ideas or something? Any? What are your thoughts around housing? Um. Yeah. I. Housing is a tricky. It's a tricky thing, right? I completely agree with Dave. I think prefabricated is the way to go. I felt that way in 2017 when Coffee Park was destroyed. Um and other parts of Sonoma County, that the fastest way to get it to work would be prefab. Um, and there are lots of choices, right? We're not talking about little sheds that like get put up, right? There's lots the of shed, floor plans. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's, you know, I actually have looked at prefabricated um, houses and, you know, have a floor plan I really love. So there's there's certain things, there, there's a lot of opportunity. Um, you know, and it's not, it goes beyond, um, female trailers and, um, which are not always safe in various environments, right? We know that you can't put those in certain places because that, that's, that's not a safe place for you to live, nor would it yeah. be permitted, right? There are other communities that won't allow those types of things to have to be, um, in their, in their city or county boundaries. So I think there's a lot of opportunity, but the, the goal of getting, Getting housing there as quickly as possible so that you can, one, free up your hotel rooms for your income, right, for your tourism dollars that are what you survive on. And that allows the individual and the family, um, whether it's nuclear or um, more, to stay in the area, in their home, right, the place that they love, the place that they call home, to to build a life again, right? And so, and so housing is a huge part of that. It's It's a cornerstone element along with things like schooling and education and jobs that that really help create the solidity that you need to continue to have long-term recovery. 
And then to make sure um, that you're actually building the economy back at the same time that you're building, I think it's what we're all saying, the housing and, you know, can feel a little crass even to be talking about economy after a major disaster. But, you know, what we can't do is continue to try to build back um, places that also they're going to need an economy for people to live in them. And this is a thing that Greenville is facing, too. And Greenville went and met the people from Greenville, I think it's Greenville, Kansas, um, after their fires. They they flew out there because the entire town was lost and they rebuilt the town and they did a really great job. And But they didn't rebuild a big economy next to it. And so it's 10 years later or 15, I think it's 10 or 15 years later, I can't remember now. And, and so they are like, okay, this is great. We have this amazing rebuild. We did such a good job as a community. But we don't have a, a we don't have an economic driver here, and that's that's a bit of a bummer. I'm actually hoping that there is some kind of opportunity for more ADUs there, just to get them started, because it would also help in their longer term RENA requirements. And um, so that's one of the things. And it would be great to see some kind of um, uh, something that would that could be paneled there, that could be manufactured there. And, and I, I shipped over is just going to have to happen on some level. But I think I'm optimistic about the mass timber, Alicia. I don't know if you stayed um, long enough uh, to, to see um, Jonathan Cushell from Sierra Institute, um, mm -hmm. his presentation. It was, I am, I am enamored with this, um, uh, how, the houses that they built. Dave, they're amazing. You should go to Greenville and just like, just lay up. I mean, it's just so beautiful. I can't even believe how beautiful it is, but you can use timber products that normally you wouldn't use that aren't used for housing, but it's the process. Um, and it's seismically sound and, and um, very fire resistant. Nothing is fireproof, but it's one of the things that, that I'm really hoping I, you know, no matter what Maui is going to be a very long and complicated recovery. Um, let's talk about uh, don't go ahead, Alicia. I can see. You I was going to say. I think the one thing we didn't mention was the permitting process at the city. Oh, and please do. Yeah, go for and it. And that yeah. is a place where you could get hung up, or you could ease the way. And so, just being able to, you know, as a as a government leader, understand that the red tape you've created over the past one hundred years of your existence can either help to speed up that process if done effectively or really put a barrier to uh, a quick rebuild um, on any way, right? On any any form that you choose to do, even if it's to build back exactly as you were before. And so I think that that's one piece that really needs to be considered is how, how do you address the permitting concerns and do it in a timely fashion? The the other thing I would add to is that what we need to recognize in every community um, is understanding the environment with which rebuild is occurring, right? So in Santa Cruz County, we are in a seismically diverse location. So community members don't understand why I need to have all of this engineering to my foundation well, it's so that your house stays up in an earthquake. In Maui, it's a very humid environment, right? So certain building materials will not last. And the last thing you want to do is build somebody a home that three, four, 10 years from now rots away. So you have to think about alternative building systems or systems that are place specific and place sustainable. Um, and that's why cinder block, that's why things like Rostra um, may be more appropriate in those locations because it can stand the test of the weather more effectively than some other materials. So I think it's, we, we have to learn and be able to educate our communities around the place that we live and the materials and the why behind what rebuild looks like. It's such a good, it's such a good point in that what does work, I think that's been one of the struggles for FEMA for the last six years is that a lot of their systems are set up for wind and rain and flooding and getting a certain number of people just back to their homes after the, after they've been mucked and they can be made livable. Um, but in, you know, mega fires, there's just nothing there. And so they, uh, I'm not criticizing FEMA, but they've been trying to sort of serve the same way. And they've been doing some things a little bit different, like in, um, in Southern Oregon and, and the Almeida fire in Talent, which was destroyed in Phoenix, both of those small working class towns were destroyed right um, next to Ashland, which is more affluent. Um, 
they in totem uh, that park when they rebuilt it they rebuilt the infrastructure under the ground which is something you see in fires you don't often see that that same kind of damage at all in a wind or rain event that mega fires destroy the infrastructure the water systems all that stuff so they replaced it and then they made a commitment to leave it um, instead of doing what they would normally do because of a gift of public funds, they'd normally go in and they would rip it all out. And so what I'm hoping is that they take some of those lessons and do them on a more widespread basis for Maui, because there is going to be a, you know, relatively small, you know, the, the, the fire actually has a relatively small footprint, but they're going to have a huge amount of destruction and, um, and, and so I'm hoping that they that they figure that out as a matter of equity and that also um, that they think about how to, I'm sure they're thinking about this, but they have an opportunity, even though it's going to be a little more expensive on the front end, to um, create their housing stock for the next 100 years through complex perils. Nobody knows about complex perils more than Santa Cruz County. Just saying. Yeah, no, there's, there's a lot. There's a lot. Um, that's going on here in our community, um, and a lot that's that they're facing there. And and I think it's important to recognize. And I was talking with a state official who was over there for a number of weeks. The community, the elected officials, those in the leadership role of rebuilding, are in a trauma state as well, right? And so we all, from the outside, have these ideas. We want to support and share our experience, and they can only take in so much information right now and right now it's one step in front of the other um for all for everyone right those in charge of the recovery process it's debris removal it's honoring those that are lost and 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 not recovered in the debris and you know they will get to a place of thinking about all of these things i don't know where they are right now um but it will take time to be able to assimilate all of these great ideas and interest and lessons learned from communities around the country and around the world to support their recovery. Yeah, I think they're in that really weird, well, I, I know because I'm watching every day, they're in that really weird stage where the world has sort of moved on. Uh, mm -hmm. The national media, the global media has all moved on. So, and, that, and, and that's a relief on one hand, huge relief. I was like, so it's so personal and traumatic and all the like Anderson Cooper, no offense and Anderson Cooper, but that he's on your, I hated that. Like we all hated that, but we also need it in order to get all the donations and to get the help that you need. And it's worth the all eyes on you because it's so terrible, but it's also so invasive. And um, I think that one of the things that's been, I'm glad you said that. One of the things that's been um, really important in our work is that because we always deploy, we usually go earlier, but we waited. We're not going until December now. And we waited because there was such an influx. And there was so much trauma um, that it was really important that we don't, I didn't want to be like part of the noise initially. It was really just too much noise. And I was afraid that we would get that um, the efforts would be for not that it would just be, we'd just be one more group of people there to try to help with that sort of frantic um, you know, desire, but you're right. They can't, but I've even had to train people who've worked for me to, I've had to say, it doesn't matter if you know the answer, they can't hear it right now. So just hold back and ask, just keep asking questions and then we will figure out where they are. And then we'll try to give them peer to peer support, but you can go in there with all of the answers. They, they're not gonna be able to hear it. You're totally right. Yeah. But they did replace their emergency manager with a really cool guy. So he's, he has such high public trust mm -hmm. that social capital factor is just absolutely immense though. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. Um, okay. Well, this was, I, I really enjoyed this. Thank you so much. Alicia, is there something that you wish I would have asked you or brought up that I didn't? You know, I think, no, I think we, we covered most of it. Um, I really feel like there's that the timing of it is so incredibly important, not just for, for Maui, but also in general for every disaster, um, knowing, listening first to where the community is, even, even if you're a local leader, right. You, you're, you're there, you're knee deep in it, listening first and then moving at the speed that the community wants you to move in the direction that you want to be, that, you know, they're willing to go. I think that's the key part of, that's the basis of a, of a successful recovery. 
but that's can you can I ask you a question they're like because I'm watching this play out right now because the community is like we don't we're, the community that was immediately most affected they're saying we do not want to be open to tourism in Maui but they opened on the 8th they're like we are raw we're like a raw it's just too much and um but then the people who are have their small businesses or or their rest of their economy or have those jobs are like but we have to because there's no federal relief there's no fund for them to actually come back and recover so that tension though which is how i mean we had people coming to blows here in sonoma county over that exact same issue so can you quickly address like that you don't have to have a perfect yeah. answer Get your thoughts. No, I mean, you bring up a good point, right? That it, just because you're listening to the community doesn't, doesn't mean they're all talking with one voice, right. right? And so just that ability to say, okay, we hear you about being raw and we totally agree. You are raw. We are raw, right? We feel it. We, Jennifer, you and I've been there. David's been there too. We know what that feels like. We all also know that there is a need for dollars to come into a community that can't be covered by the government by the federal, state, or local governments. It's not possible. And so you have to split the difference. Is it what the survivors wanna hear, even if they own a business? No, they don't. They want time to recover, but they also still, you've gotta, you know, there's gotta be a little bit of give and take in what that looks like. And I think that's the real key part of recovery is that we don't all get our way every single moment of, of the recovery. Um, I wish we did, but that's not how capitalism works. And so, you know, being able to, to open up the economy, open up the tourism in, in Maui and, or in other places and say, okay, we're ready for business. Here's what that's going to look like. Here's how we move through that. And then hopefully using that to process the trauma that has happened for you over the last six, 12, 18, 24 months, what, however long it takes, um, I think is a really key part of that. But you don't open up or keep it closed without listening to the community first. Dave? Um, I would add, you know, in addition to the, the key aspect of listening from a government standpoint, repetition actually is something that I've learned through these disasters is that you, you think in government, you do it once, maybe you do it twice and you think I've done it. I'm done. I, I had a community meeting, um, in February and in May of 2021 after our August, 2020 fires about what recovery and rebuilding was going to be looking like. And I thought, okay, great. We did it twice not realizing probably should have done it every quarter for three years because people come in at different stages and it's the same with advocacy, right? You know, it's, you're going to get three denials. We need to be there and repeat the same message to fe the federal government with each of those denials to support you as, as community members. So it's not the responsibility of government to do it once you know, we need to do it multiple times in support of recovery um, on lots of levels. Actually, just as a side note, um, one of the first things that we were told in uh, 2017 was that we were going to have to go back to DC constantly in order to make sure that our community was well served. And we did that. I think that we did that. Uh, you know, we started in January of 2018. And then I was there again, five or four weeks ago, like two weeks before the summit, which is a little crazy. But, um, you know, you have to continuously make that heard and known. And a lot of people on the West Coast, they don't, you know, you don't think about the need to go do advocacy or you think that there isn't a space for you or someone has to invite you to go do that in D.C. People are like, how do you, they say to me, how do you get those appointments? I'm like, yeah, I ask, you know, and I have a, I mean, obviously they know, they know our organization and they know that our game is tight, but we had to learn, we had to earn and learn all of that. And, and one of the things we do is that we teach every other community that we come into contact with, if they want, you know, if they have something that they they need or want, or we go as a coalition, um, but to teach advocacy is so important as a matter of equity too, especially mm -hmm. for all of the communities that have low um, capacity, like Plumas County only has 15,000 people. You know, that's a hard uh, capacity issue. There's mm -hmm. just tough, man. You know, Kevin Goss, Supervisor Goss, who you probably met at the summit, or he's, I, I love him. Um, but he was um, at one point like in the first six months of their recovery, he was, he lost his business. He was a super a chair of the board of supervisors, the interim CAO, the interim um, um, auditor controller all at once. 
that's an, that's a matter of equity too. Yeah. 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 Um, was there anything else that I didn't cover that you wish that I had um, before we um, call it a day? No, I don't think so. Well, thank yeah. you so much. I will see this is like an opening conversation. Um, we do um, drop all of your um, info in the links. And so if people want to find out more about you or contact you, then uh, we provide all that information and or they could also reach out to me and I'm happy to connect you. Um, thank you so much. I, what I love the most about this work is all the people um, along the way. I, call, I, I often tell people I'm a curator of super cool people. That's like my major job in this space is to, you know, bring as many of you together. And I appreciate, I love the fact that you guys are working together um, on this and that Alicia could bring also her experience from uh, Sonoma County and that disaster to Santa Cruz. So thank you for all the hard work that you do. Thank you. Okay. All right. That's it. This has been another episode of the How to Disaster podcast, where we help you recover, rebuild, and reimagine. Thank you for joining us on the podcast, How to Disaster. For more information, please visit our website at afterthefireusa.org. And if you liked this video, please hit subscribe.